Hi, and welcome to uh, Red Reviews, number 10. <laughs> 20 weeks. <laughs> That's amazing. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. So uh, thanks for doing this. I, I think it's a, been a really good addition to the show. So, Well, thank you for letting me do it. I mean, it's been a real pleasure for me. I've really enjoyed doing this myself. It's something I look forward to doing. I love doing the prep work for it because it's a lot of fun to just – you know, you know, I'm doing, I'm reading a lot of this stuff anyway. So the other thing too, is that it also keeps me on track. So like, if I know I need, like, I have like a day, I know that I've scheduled, <laughs> right. I'm going to do this book. Like I have to get it done. Yeah. So like, that's kind of the other thing too. It keeps me on track, but yeah, 10 episodes we've done now. Um, and I couldn't think of a better book to do tonight to celebrate doing 10 of these than a book that was Re- that has been really important to me and one that has really shaped my own sort of political evolution. Um, you know, it's the book that really, for me, uh, besides actually just reading foundational texts of Marxism and Lenin, made me a Marxist Leninist. It, it sort of solidified my political ideology as it is. Um, for now, at least, you know, who knows, but, but, but basically, you know, but like where I'm at right now, it's it. And so tonight the book is, um, Black Shirts and Reds by Michael Parenti. Uh, the subtitle is Rational Fascism and the Overthrow of Communism. This is a book that everybody should read. It's very, very short. It's, you know, it's less than 200 pages. It's very easy to read. And in fact, if you're interested in like listening to parts of it via audio, you can check out the Revolutionary Left Radio podcast who's done, I think, episodes on it. Um, not to plug another podcast other than your yeah. own, but, but you know, because obviously everybody <laughs> should be listening to The Mind of a Skeptical Leptist and everybody should be fo- uh, following you on all the socials and com- contributing to Patreon. Um, but, <laughs> of course, of course, but after you've done all of that, after you've done all of that, you can check out the, the audio version of it as well. Um, this book came out in 1997. Um, and even though there has been, you know, almost 25 years separation between its publication and now, I think the core arguments of the book, the, the key historical components of the book, the theoretical part components of the book are super important for us going forward. Um, and I think this is, um, this will be an interesting episode tonight because I think there are going to be conclusions that Perini comes to that are controversial, um, but ones that I think are worth considering. Um, right. and, 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 and I think that, um, you know, if, you know, with your specific orientation, like if there's like a, like this one might require a little more back and forth. Okay. So like if you want to kind of jump in and say like, Hey, this is how I view this as an sure. anarchist, like jump in, <laughs> like that's fine. Okay. Cause I, I want to have that kind of push, like that kind of push and pull with it. Cause I understand like this book has a very specific point of view. Right. Right. So, so just to give you a quick overview before we go into specific chapters, The book is really about a few major components. The first one is understanding fascism, how fascism took hold in Europe, and why the sort of common notion of fascism as being this like very irrational thing, um, as being kind of a misnomer. And the phrase that he uses in the book is that, you know, fascism was using sort of irrational means for very rational ends, because fascism in and of itself is essentially the uh, complete and total domination of a state or of society by capitalism. Right, Th- right. That's what fascism is, right? But what separates fascism from sort of, you know, run-of-the-mill right-wing reactionary politics, at least in Perini's estimation, is that the difference between like sort of re- right-wingers and fascists is that fascists have essentially uh, – revolutionary garb they sort of dress themselves up as being revolutionary or transformational right so like nazis right it was the national socialist party right even though you know so so even though they weren't necessarily socialist i don't think they were socialist at all they took that (laughs) name in an attempt to get people who could be sort of squishy you know people who sort of weren't necessarily firmly either in the sort of social democratic 
party of Germany or weren't a part of the Communist Party. Um, and it sort of it, it achieved that kind of goal, right? So, so it's about fascism. The other component about it is talking about communism and 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 in a broader understanding, both historically and theoretically, and about how there's um, an effort to undermine communism as an idea. Um, and when we say communism, we don't mean like the sort of the communism of the abstract. We mean actual communism. So like right. it is the Soviet Union. It is the DPRK. It is China. Yeah. It is it is um, Vietnam and Cuba, like actually existing socialism. Right. And a lot of the sort of myths and distortions and outright lies that have been told about actually existing socialism over the decades and sort of dispelling those myths Okay. Um, in an effort for us to get a more accurate picture of actually existing socialism, flaws and all, right? Flaws right. and all, but getting a more accurate picture that isn't painted by the sort of capitalist imperialist viewpoint that often comes out of the West um, or out of the United States or the capitalist world, right? Yeah, yeah. Because um, the West, in and of itself, is an, is is a very it's a term that has a lot of baggage, right? So, like, <laughs> yeah, gen right. generally, when we say the West, what we mean by that is the United States, Western Europe, the yeah. Anglophone countries that are all, you know, deeply capitalist, deeply imperialist. That's sort yeah. of what is meant by the West, right? He talks about the sort of structural problems within the Soviet Union that sort of led to its fall and why the fall of the Soviet Union was not a really a moment to rejoice. It was actually a, mo a, a moment to realize just how bad things could get. Because once the Soviet Union collapsed, what replaced mm -hmm. it was this sort of very right-wing, very pro-capitalist, sometimes even proto-fascist governments that now exist today in Russia and in Eastern Europe. So that have pretty much yeah. replaced the Soviet Union. Um, and, uh, and, it, uh, and I think in, in for a lot of people, especially people who live or are old enough to remember living under the Soviet Union, um, is objectively worse for them in terms of material material conditions, just objectively worse. Right. Um, and then the, so he spends about two, three chapters on that. And then the last couple of chapters of the book are about the importance of Marxism as a sort of theoretical framework and why Marxism matters okay. um, and why we shouldn't abandon it, why we shouldn't you run from it, you know, and him writing this in the late nineties is really important, right? Cause he's one of the few people sort of holding the mantle for, um, Marxism and specifically Marxism Leninism at a time when that was extremely, you know, uh, gauche for the mainstream crowd, even intellectuals, right? Um, we were, you know, the 1990s was very much the beginning of the sort of intellectual drift away from Marxism into sort of postmodernism and into other forms of sort of explicitly non Marxist left political philosophies. And then the last chapter is about um, class. And why class matters, but how, but he actually sort of anticipates the sort of class reductionism um, accusation and and um, actually pretty much rebuts it um, and, and explains okay. why the class analysis is intimately intertwined with notions of race and gender and the environment. Yeah. So yeah. so that's kind of a brief overview, and then we can get into sort of the the, cool. the, the meat of it. Yeah, I was. I mean. <sighs> I mean, we will touch on it more in depth when we get to that chapter, but, uh, the thing that always comes to me, mind for me is, uh, like, uh, intersectionality. Like I've heard mm -hmm. many, I've heard many people talk about how Marxism is incompatible with intersectionality, but I've always thought like class is one of the intersections. Yep. <laughs> so how can you, how can you say that it's not, a, you know, compatible when that's literally part of the whole thing? <laughs> yeah, right. Where and what's weird is that like by no means were they like perfect on this, but if you actually read Marx and Engels and actually Lenin too cuz you know, on things like the national question, um they do mention notions of cl of race. They do mention notions of gender, right? So oh, okay, yeah. Engels himself wrote an entire book called The Origin of the Family, Private Property and the State, where he lays out those particular relations. Um, and, and I would say like, even in his own writings, part of it was a mix of things. Engels lived about 12 years longer than Marx did. And Engels also had a much different personal life than Marx did. So I mm -hmm. think that also influenced it. So for example, like 
Marx was far more like small C conservative in his personal life than Engels was. He had oh, okay. one wife, I think, his entire life. Um, he, he he was not into sort of notions of at the 19th century, especially the late mid to late 19th century. The notions of free love were very big, and Engels sort of gravitated to those more than Marx did. Okay. Engels was much more of a of a, a libertine or a raconteur than than Marx was. Um, <laughs> okay. Engels, as far as I know, Marx, uh, as far as I know, Engels never really married. He had permanent partners, but he never married. Um, and at one point, his first partner dies, and he and then he ends up dating his her sister. So like, it's which if you watch the 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 docu the sort of dr- docu drama movie The Young Marx, there's actually a hint at it where he sort of talks to. Uh, his partner's his first partner's younger sister. Okay, but anyway, that's a bit of a digression. But yes, so like you're right. So like intersectionality itself comes out of academia. It's by uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, and she comes out of that sort of radical, in some senses, Marxist viewpoint. She's not like explicitly a Marxist, but like this idea that that intersectionality is incompatible with Marxism is nonsense. Considering so, there are so many influential Marxists throughout the 19th and 20th centuries that were, you know, people of color or women. So I think of obviously, (laughs) you know, you know, I think of people like Angela Davis or the Black Panthers or um, Kwame Ture, Stokely Carmichael, um, Malcolm X. So like this idea that, you know, Malcolm X wasn't explicitly a Marxist, but was, was definitely, you know, had socialist, um, you know, leanings. Um, so yeah, like I, they are <laughs> compatible and we'll kind of go into that later. So, cool. so the first chapter of the book, um, is about what he calls rational fascism. And one of the things that historians often do when they talk about fascism is they say that, well, it was, you know, it's very unique to Germany. You know, the, 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 the sort okay. of cultural context of Germany is why it became fascist. Which belies the fact that Italy was fascist too right. and went fascist first. It went fascist, <laughs> you know, almost a decade before the Germany did. Yeah. And the point that Perini makes in the book is that that um, Mussolini himself, Benito Mussolini, the fascist leader of Italy from the 1920s until his execution in, I think, 1945, um, uh, he was actually a Marxist. He was a socialist in his earlier years and, in fact, had yeah. had – conversations with Lenin um, and I think Rosa Luxemburg too and but he realized that like if he could take power with the business interests he would do it so he sort of used the sort of revolutionary rhetoric or the sort of revolutionary patina of Marxism to catapult himself straight into fascism and the coup that sort of leads to the takeover of Italy by the fascists in the early 1920s was bankrolled by financial interests. Um, So for example, he mentions in, uh, in 1922, the Federazione Industriale, which was Mussolini's fascist party composed of the leaders of industry, along with representatives from the banking and agribusiness associations, met with Mussolini to plan the march on Rome, contributing 20 million, million lira, which was which is their currency, or was their currency, to the undertaking. With the additional backing of Italy's top military officers and police chiefs, the fascist revolution, quote-unquote, really a coup d'etat took place. Um, and when it happened, the the... The uh, demographic that was hurt the most by the takeover of fascism was, were the communists, who did endure as as much as they could endure, um, but many of them were either imprisoned or executed, and sometimes both. Probably right. the most famous one to people is the Marxist intellectual Antonio Gramsci, who was a prisoner of the Italian fascists and died in prison, I think, uh, from you know, abuses. Uh, I think he, I think it was in 1936. Um, and so the Germany, the situation is very similar, wherein the, the, the sort of the, the fascist party that develops in there, the, you know, the, the, the national socialist party of Germany, the Nazis, um, they come to power in 1933 
It's largely a bloodless coup. Um, it just sort of happens. The president of Germany, Hindenburg, essentially gave power over to um, Hitler, who became chancellor of Germany. And the Communist Party of Germany tried to do a last minute effort after the elections of 1932, had tried to do a last ditch effort to do you have a coalition with the Social Democratic Party of Germany or the S, uh, the SPD? Right. And um, and so they tried and they really wanted to try to build that kind of unity. And the SPD didn't want any any of it. They decided no. And so ultimately they sided with the fascists. Um, and because what people don't often know is that the Nazis never – one like really won um an election in Germany, like a plurality of the, the vote for the Reichstag or the Congress of Germany, their their executive branch. So, like for example, you know, uh, in the campaign um, of 1932, they only received 37.3 percent of the vote. Um, right, and so. The thing that's understanding is like if you think of like the Social Democratic Party, like they were far more willing to side with the fascists than they were with the communists. <laughs> and I think that tells you all you need to know, which is that that's still how it is today. Right. You know, the sort of bourgeois liberal parties, right? So if like if there was a true communist party in the United States – and it could enter into a coalition with the Democratic Party to stop like a fascist Republican Party for coming into power. The Democrats would side with the Republicans and the fascists because ultimately yeah. class interests matter far more than whatever notions of democracy or human rights that you care about. Yeah. And so uh, the thing that he mentions, and I said it earlier, is this idea that, you know, uh, you know, they – they were – fascists are often pegged as being socialists because they, they, they – people think of them as being sort of thrifty or whatever. But like the fascists, especially Nazis, plundered an immense amount of wealth and Hitler himself got an immense amount of wealth and, yeah. and privilege under his reign. And one thing that's particularly interesting is that he actually um, – in, he, intervent, he invented a new concept which was called the pro personality right. Um, which, quote, enabled him to charge a small fee for every postage, postage stamp with his picture on it, a venture that made him hundreds of millions of marks. So right. he basically trademarked his face and made the German public pay for it, um, which yeah. I think speaks volumes about where we're at here. Yeah, I think uh, one of the things that really struck out to me when I was reading up on stuff was that, uh, like, the Nazis, they shut down unions – and in favor, put up like a an org a government organization yep. that ruled over the workers. So there was no uh, worker representation. And if you complained, then you were you know imprisoned or you were you know left to uh, you were punished in some way. So there was no union benefits. There was no workers that could benefit from uh, representation the way socialists might do it. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a that's a really really good point. The other thing that's really important is the notion of outside forces that sort of pushed fascism into the front, into the fore. So, like, for example, one of America's most celebrated capitalists, Henry Ford, was a fascist and supported Hitler. He actually had a portrait of Hitler in his office and, and, and Hitler had the opposite um, and supported the effort to have him become – the leader of Germany. I'm trying to remember where he, where Perini says this specifically in the book, but it is, I think, a very important point, which is that, um, you know, what the reason why fascism can come to power and be as gruesome as it is, is that it serves the interest of the capitalist class. Yeah. Because the capitalists, their lives are largely unimpeded, and it can enter in sort of monopoly capitalism where you can do away with a lot of competition. Because people often think that capitalism and competition go hand in hand when in reality they really don't. No. Capitalism lends itself to monopoly and cartelization far more than it does to competition. Yeah. Um, so I think that's really important. Um, so he says uh, here – uh, Italian fascism and German Nazism had their admirers within the U.S. business community and the corporate-owned press. 
Bankers, publishers, and industrialists, including the likes of Henry Ford, traveled to Rome and Berlin to pay homage, receive medals, and strike profitable deals. Many did their utmost to advance the Nazi war effort, sharing military industrial secrets and engaging in secret transactions with the Nazi government even after the United States entered the war. Um, if you want to learn more about this um, in documentary form, I highly recommend the multi-part series um, that Oliver Stone did called An Untold History of the United States, where he goes into the specific banking ties, um, particularly future members of U.S. government post-World War II who are definitely connected to fascist and Nazi right. banking interests. So the, there were outside forces that were um, – that were kind of bankrolling this shit from the very beginning. The other interesting story here is that uh, William Randolph Hearst's, new Hearst's newspapers, the very wealthy newspaper publisher from the United States, entered into a very lucrative deal with the Nazis. And in exchange okay. for exclusive rights to his international wire service, which is how you, you'd have, it's kind of like the AP today where you'd have newspaper articles go all over right. the country or all over the world. Um, in exchange for that, that uh, the, United, the Nazis would get positive coverage in his newspapers. And in fact, some high-ranking Nazi officials actually wrote editorials in Hearst newspapers, including Hermann Goring. So, okay. so that's, you know, so right off the bat, I mean, you can go to New York Times. New York Times says nice things about Hitler in the 30s. Like, right, so it's right. like there's all kinds of shit like that. So this gets us into talking about what happens after the Second World War. So obviously fascism is defeated in the Second World War, largely thanks to the Red Army and yeah. the Soviet Union, um, who lost millions of lives. I think it was like 27 million lives in World War II. Um, and uh, what happened was, was instead of actually persecute, not persecuting, but actually punishing and holding fascists accountable, Western powers largely absorbed them. So, uh, so for example, probably the most known that people at remember is Operation Paperclip, which was yeah. the secret U.S. plan to bring over German scientists and engineers to work on Na to work at NASA. Um, specifically, people like Werner von Braun, who helped design rockets for NASA, who was who was an out and out Nazi. Um, so there's that. I'm trying to think of what else. Um, uh, in Italy, there was something launched um, called Operation Gladio, which was a NATO-inspired anti-communist mercenary force that did a sort of strategy of tension. Okay. So, you know, hundreds of Nazi war criminals found a haven in the United States. This is me quoting from Parenti. Either living in comfortable anonymity or actively employed by U.S. intelligence agencies during the Cold War and otherwise. Um, enjoying the protection of high-placed individuals, some of them found their way into Republican presidential campaign committees of Richard Nixon, Ronald Reagan, and George H.W. Bush, um, the first Bush. Um, in contrast, when the communists took East Germany, or the GDR, uh, when they took over East Germany, they removed some 80% of the judges, teachers, and officials for their Nazi collaboration. They imprisoned thousands, and they executed 600 Nazi party leaders for war crimes. This, they would have shot more of the war criminals had not so many fled to the protective embrace of the West. Now, yeah. we can talk about whether or not execution is wrong, and we can go into those moral questions. But I think it's very telling that the people who, who were supposedly saving us from fascism ultimately absorbed a lot of the fascists. And then the enemy after the war, the sort of evil communists or the evil Soviets, they were the ones who actually punished fascists for being fascists after yeah. the war. So ultimately, I think the main like the main lesson from this chapter is a quote that he has that I think is really important, and it's something we mentioned earlier, which is let's see. I'm trying to find out where it is. Yeah, here we go. So this is from Perny again. Some writers stress the irrational features of fascism. By doing so, they overlook the rational political economic functions that fascism performed. Much of politics is the rational manipulation of, of irrational symbols. Certainly, this is true of fascist ideology, whose emotive appeals have served a class control function. So fascism succeeded largely because of capitalism. Yeah. And and had fascism morphed into an actual left-wing ideology that was about um, you know, class struggle and solidarity and, and equity, um, then the West would have gone after it mercilessly, which is exactly what they did to the Soviet Union after the war. Yeah. Um, so 
So the second chapter is called Let Us Now Praise Revolution, where he goes in and he talks about the importance of, of revolutionary struggle and why revolutionary uh, struggle is so important to um, sort of the advancement of left politics. And he talks about how, um, you know, he has this really great and interesting quote on violence, which is really important because I think there's this sort of this sort of kind of bourgeois or sort of liberal notion of violence that like all violence is evil unless it's done by the u.s state in service of regime change or humanitarian aid or what the fuck ever so you know he talks about this so he says uh this is from chapter two so he says the very concept of revolutionary violence is somewhat falsely cast since most of the violence comes from those who attempt to prevent reform not from those struggling for reform By focusing on the violent rebellions of the downtrodden, we overlook the much greater repressive force and violence utilized by the ruling oligarchs to maintain the status quo, including armed attacks against peaceful demonstrations, mass arrests, torture, destruction of opposition organizations, suppression of dissident publications, death squad assassinations, the extermination of whole villages and the like. So this is, I think, very important. So one of the things people don't realize is that when the, when the, when the Bolshevik revolution happened in October of 1917, it was largely nonviolent. The reason it became violent was because the Western powers decided to spend massive amounts of money and get a lot of forces together to try to suppress the revolutionary, the new revolutionary government of Russia. That was the big reason why violence began to break out mm. in that country. Castro, Fidel Castro makes this point, too, in a clip I remember recently. He's like, we did not choose violence. So violence is thrust upon us because of the nature of how the capitalist imperialist system works. You know, The only thing it truly understands is violence. So sometimes that's the only thing you can do. Right. And in doing that, sometimes you can make the world a better place. And so what he says is, you know, he talks about how, you know, like there are parts of the world like Cuba or the the Indian state of Kerala, which is which is run by the the Indian Communist Party. These are parts of the world that have sort of instigated revolutions and have developed social systems independent of the capitalist imperialist system. And you say what you want, criticisms aside, and there are some for sure, like these are systems that have benefited their people tremendously, you know, like, right. you know, human mortality is, dr- was dramatically lowered under, under the revolutionary government of Cuba. And in fact, literacy in Cuba today is yeah. better than it is in the United States. Yeah. So, and in Kerala, it's the same thing where, you know, the only state of India that has even remotely handled COVID particularly well is the state of Kerala because of its strong social protections instituted by the communist government of that state. So and I think we've talked about this before regarding Cuba is like the, when you measure like the daily caloric intake of citizens in Cuba, you get a higher number for that for Cuba than you do in the United States as well. Like, yes. So less people are going hungry in Cuba than are going hungry in the United States. Absolutely. And there's no and there's no homelessness in Cuba either. Right, right. Which is kind of the other thing too, right? And they have universal health care. I mean, you know, you know, Cuba, you know, has a very is a very small island country. It's largely isolated, has become more so since the fall of the Soviet Union in nineteen ninety one. Yeah. And yet it still has, you know, like I said, like you said earlier, you know, their their populace is better fed. There's no homelessness. Like the medical yeah. system is for everyone. Like there's a certain level of, of real achievement there. Yeah. And, you know, and again, that's like, I'm not saying it's that not like, utopia, but no. it's, it's, uh, there's outcomes that are better than they are in quote unquote, uh, you know, developed countries or whatever yep. you want to call the United States. And what's really important is, and this is the thing that he, I think Perini makes a point of saying in here is I can't remember if it's in this chapter or it's just a point he's made before, which is that you always kind of have to compare. Let's see. Um, Let's see. Like, yeah, let's see here. Um, Like, ultimately, you always have to compare the system that's in place to what directly preceded it, right? So like Mm -hmm. in Cuba, for example... That was a society that was largely a like a, a a a sort of dictatorship that was controlled by the United States, 
where, you know, children lived in squalor and there was, you know, violence and prostitution and untold human misery. And right. there were no hospitals. There were no schools. There was no real any meanings of social welfare whatsoever. And then when the revolution happened in 1959 and for, you know, over 60 years now, um, the, 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 the conditions of Cuba are objectively better than they were before. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's what you always have to compare. People say, well, it's a lack of democracy. Well, they didn't have democracy before. Right. You know, Russia didn't have democracy before. China didn't have democracy before. Cuba didn't have it before. So, yes, this may not be particularly democratic to you or to us in this sort of standard understanding. Right. But it's far more democratic than the system they had before. And like and it's and, and so it's important to like not sugarcoat it, not be utopian, as you said. But it's important to acknowledge that like things got objectively better for the vast majority of people. They just did. And yeah. um, and so, yeah, so we can kind of leave it at that's kind of that chapter. Um, and the, the next chapter is probably there's two chapters of the book that are very controversial. This is one of them. Okay. So the so the third chapter of the book is called Left Anti-Communism. OK, this is this is his chapter where he shits on Noam Chomsky. Ah. Um, so, so basically we'll get, so we'll talk about this. So like he talks about how the way in which Noam Chomsky talks about actually existing socialism, where he talks about Marxism or Leninism, um, sounds almost indistinguishable from some right wing hack writing for national review or commentary. Right. And that's true. I mean, I, I, and, and. There are, I think there are deep theoretical deficiencies in Noam Chomsky's writing and thought. Um, I think there's a, there's a massive difference between reading Noam Chomsky and reading Michael Parenti. Obviously, like, they have different political beliefs and different political perspectives, but also, like, Parenti is also, is just far more theoretically astute. He under, and part of that is because he's a Marxist. Like, you know, Chomsky is not a Marxist. So he has, he really kind of has nothing to stand on. And the solutions that Chomsky largely offers yeah. are just like, let's have a general strike. Okay. Which, I mean, yes. Which, but <laughs> it's fine. Like, that's great, right? But like, okay, well, who's going to organize the strike? And and who's going to make sure, like, like th these are questions that are deep differences on the left, right? So like, my opinion is like, it'd be great to have a general strike, but like, yeah. A general strike is largely worthless unless you have a plan. Yeah. And and yeah. you have to have a plan. And in my opinion, as a Marxist-Leninist, a, 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 a thing like that requires a party. You know, it requires some kind of organizational force to strategize and to implement, you know, a, a, a series of steps to get us where we want to go. Right. Right. And I think like the beauty of anarchism is this idea of like, well, we don't need that shit. Like, and, and I <laughs> and I get that. Right. But like. There's a difference between like the real world and how the real world works versus like the ideal that people have in their head. Yeah. And that's the criticism that um, Prenny has of sort of left anti-communists is that a lot of them are sort of like they want this like perfect fucking utopia that is that is virtually non-existent. It couldn't happen. Right. So like the states, the, the, the existing social states, flaws and all are products of material conditions. Yeah. And so. You know, a lot of them had to fight back onslaught of the sort of capitalist imperialist forces who, who just absolute rained fire on them for decades. So the fact that the Soviet Union lasted as long as it did, the fact that Cuba has lasted as long as it did is a real testament to that model. Yeah. But I know that there are real criticisms and I'll leave it at that. You can kind of jump in here. Well, I just uh, a couple things that came to mind is like, uh, obviously, I'm very pro uh, general strike. Uh Obviously, you do need people to organize this. You do need, uh, like, I don't know if you would call it a party per se, but you need a group of people to get together. Like, uh, we have the IWW, right? Like, mm -hmm. you could have the, the that group get together and organize whatever, right? Which I guess unions and and parties might not be that different if you <laughs> you know if you're using them to organize people in in a, a way that is standing up to the status quo. Um, yeah. And I mean, there, there are certainly anarchists that are not standing on like as firm a theoretical framework as Marxists, right? Like you have, 
uh, a lot of science is behind Marxism. <laughs> so, yeah, but we'll, uh, we'll get into that in a little later so, chapter, but please continue. Yeah, no. So I, I, I just, uh, but there's also many, I mean, anarchists are, are a very diverse group. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so, uh, I, I mean, I really can't say, uh, that Chomsky is the best voice for mm-hmm. anarchism either. Right. Like, and there are anti-communist anarchists <laughs> and, and we, I have my differences with them, uh, because I think the goals are the same. So we should be more on the same page, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's my, and that's generally, and I was saying this the other day, this is my criticism of, of some anarchism, not all of it. I can't speak for all of it, but my experience with talking with some people is that I find that sometimes the way that left anarchists talk about the state is almost virtually indistinguishable from libertarians. Yeah. And and I, and I find that to be very problematic because in my opinion, and this is kind of a, a theoretical difference, right? Is that um, the question isn't whether or not the state is bad or good. The question is whether or not who controls the state and why, mm. um, which is like a, a component, right? Like, so, you know, as yeah, yeah, communists, yeah. like as Marxist Leninists, we seek a stateless society, but we don't think that going straight from having a state to just not having one is the right way to go because right. the conditions will ultimately flounder. And that's kind of a point that like Perenni makes in the book. I mean, he mentions this point specifically in regards to, I think it was Spain. Let me see. Let me find it here. Um Let's see. Um, hold on. Spain, yeah. This was Spain in the 1870s. Now, obviously, the anarchists did get some control in the 1930s. But Spain in the 1870s, anarchists seized power in municipalities across the country. But the fragmentation and isolation of the revolutionary forces, which enabled the government troops to smash one revolt after the other. So um, I think what's important here is to note that, like, the problem, the sort of the, the sort of structural problem of having, like, getting rid of existing structures without necessarily thinking through exactly how those structures might be used or, or abolished leads to the sort of the bifurcation of different municipalities or structures. And yeah. so one of the criticisms that Perini has, and it's kind of pithy is that like, you know, left anti communists love all the revolutions that never worked, um, <laughs> you know, which, um, you know, but it's like, you know, but you can say what you want about like, um, you know, the different situation, of like different existing revolutions that were successful, whether it was Bol- the Bolshevik Revolution or the Cuban Revolution, um, the DPRK, China, or uh, um, Vietnam, um, those were successful, and they were explicitly along Marxist-Leninist lines. Now, again, I'm not saying that like these are amazing places, and, like there's no problems, right, everybody's right. happy, <laughs> but like they actually worked, which is the difference between say like the revolutionary anarchist governments of Spain or in the 1870s or in the 1930s or more recently with Chaz, right? Out, I think it was in what, Seattle? Like, yeah. I so mean, like that's a theoretical issue and I would just love to hear yeah. your perspective on that. Well, I think like, and I, I might, I maybe bring it up way too often, but I'm constantly talking about Rojava and okay. the autonomous zone ran by anarcho-feminists and an anarcho- you kind of a, a communalist uh, that, you know, is still maintaining uh, its hold on where it, it lo- is located. And they've had to hold themselves against uh, uh, various forces, ISIS and uh, Turkey. Uh, <laughs> so, and they've done a very good job right now. And what they kind of do is like, it's not that it's not that they don't have a, a structure to their organization, right? Like they have a military. And they have uh, people who make decisions on a day-to-day basis for how to run their military. And uh, I think too often, like, and and this is where the uh, left-wing anarchists often get uh, caught up in the Mm -hmm. anti-statism, is that they, they forget that we need to govern ourselves. Yeah. And... You don't have to, I, and, and this is where I get into the theory part, where I don't think we have to have a state to govern ourselves. What we have to have is an organizational structure, 
right? And that, I mean, call it a, a party, call it a union, call it whatever the hell you want. Yeah. But we do have to have, like, we, we have to maintain our society in some way and we have to hold against outside forces. So, mm-hmm. I mean... That's very interesting. I mean, I guess my question for you is, so the Rahava region, that's in Syria, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So here's my question for you, which is... This is one criticism I've heard of Rojava has been, and I don't know how accurate this is, so I'd like to hear what your thoughts are on this. Like, one of the criticisms that people have of Rojava is the only reason that it has largely succeeded is because the U.S. presence there has has essentially protected it. And if the U.S. presence wasn't there, then they would be fucked. But so kind of, let, let let me, I'd like to hear what you have to say about that. Well, I mean, the U.S. did supply them with arms at one time, mm-hmm. and that, but uh, when the U.S. pulled out of uh, the Kurdistan or wherever it was, like there was issues. Uh, they were very concerned, and I don't know how it's holding up. I haven't really been keeping up on it the most recently, uh, but I mean, yes, it, if you have other forces detracting from those forces that are going to come at you, that's going to help. <laughs> yeah. Like, and that's kind I'm of not my main, deny that. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that's kind of one of the criticisms people have. I mean, I, I I'm happy that uh, you know a, a sort of left alternative exists out there. I think that's good. Um but I think, you know, generally, you know, he ends the chapter with this really important passage which I think is uh worth kind of quoting here. So he says, having never understood the role that existing communist powers played in tempting the worst impulses of Western capitalism and imperialism, and having perceived communism as nothing but an unmitigated evil, the left anti-communists did not anticipate the losses that were to come. Some of them still don't get it. Yeah. And I think that's important, right? So what I think what Michael Perny is calling for here is a real sense of left unity, which is that we might have theoretical differences, but the sort of you know, the sort of chomsky dismissal of Marxism, Leninism, um, because first off, I think it's very important to note that, like, I understand that Noam Chomsky is like a very smart guy. And I know right. in a lot of ways, he's probably smarter than me. But if you've ever actually read him, to, if you've ever actually read him discussing Marx or Lenin, he comes off as someone who's never read either of them mm-hmm. or that he's read them a little bit and then moved on. Um and I, he also just doesn't give a shit about, like, the larger theoretical questions. His books are largely descriptive. They're not prescriptive. And that's what right. I would tell people. Like, I think Noam Chomsky is worth reading, okay? But I think it's worth reading knowing that, yeah. like, you're not going to really get solutions. He's just going to let you know how deep shit we're in. He's not really going to tell you how to get out of it. Because yeah. the way of getting out of it, for me... And for Michael Perenni, and why I think Michael Perenni is better, is revolution. Like, that is the way out. Like, you can't you can't reform this shit. And this idea that, like, oh, if we just elect enough AOCs to Congress... Well, like, yeah, that doesn't make it. <laughs> like, that's lovely, and that's wonderful, right? Or like, yeah. oh, we'll have a general strike. And I'm like, I love that. That sounds great. But what happens... The, the thing that's important to me is, like, what happens the day after... That's the important point. And that's yeah. something that we as leftists, regardless of your orientation, need to think about, which is that general strikes great. What comes the day after? Yeah. Because that was the yeah. problem that Occupy had. Occupy didn't think about what was going to happen after. They just sort of walked through the, you know, and I think what Occupy was did was very important. I, I'm not going to discount that at all. Yeah. But what I would say is that, like, they didn't spend enough time thinking about what happens after the protests, right? Which is something the Tea Party did. Ironically enough, the Tea Party people took the lessons of Leninism to heart. And the, the Occupy right? people didn't, <laughs> which was to their detriment, right? Yeah. And mind you, yeah. the Tea Party people were also better bankrolled and, and, and so on and yes, so forth. of course. But I know we're, like, 45 minutes. There's so much in this book that's great. <laughs> so we'll try to, like, we'll try to catch... We'll try to go quickly through some other stuff. And we'll try to get past them. Sure. So the other chapter that he talks about is sort of, it's called Communism in Wonderland, where he talks about the sort of deep structural problems that did exist within the Soviet Union that led to its collapse. Okay. Um, a lot of them stemmed from problems of production, the sort of command and controls structure of production and the planned Soviet economy started to have problems. Um, it started to lead to sort of inefficiencies. 
The other issue is that um, he sort of calls it no one's minding the store. So he says, you know, the Soviet Union gets this sort of reputation of being sort of brutally authoritarian. But in reality, what was going on, at least towards the end of the Soviet Union, was that no one was really enforcing anything on anyone, which is part of the reason, <laughs> like, like quotas were not being enforced, certain, you know, social um, organizational components were not being enforced. So he calls it no one was minding the store. Right. And because of that, it ran into issues. And then ultimately, what really led, you know, alongside all these issues was that, that there were members within the Communist Party of the Soviet Union that decided to essentially reform um, the system uh, to benefit Western capitalism and imperialism, particularly, right. you know, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, the last leader of the Soviet Union, who opened up to two policies, uh, Glasnost and Perestroika, both which were policies about openness and and sort of you know, allowing more political dissent, allowing more political parties. And the other one was sort of allowing some market forces within the system. Gorbachev's play at the time was that if we let in enough of these reforms, that it would save the system, but ultimately an undermine to the system because those were directly antithetical to one another. And you really, at that point, because of this sort of deep structural issues within the Soviet Union, you could have only had one or the other. So, you know, again, I think what's important is like Perenny sort of, often gets the charge that he's just like a full-blown tanky and that like he <laughs> thinks the Soviet Union was the greatest thing ever. And it's like, no, he actually devoted an entire chapter of this book and entire sections of the book we talked about previously, Inventing Reality, on the very deep structural issues with the Soviet Union. Yeah, yeah. So that's that chapter. The next chapter after that is probably the other most controversial chapter in the book, which is called Stalin's Fingers. Um, this book, this chapter is the chapter where... Prenny gets the accusation that he's a Stalinist, which is not true. But what he does do is he actually goes through the real historical record of what was actually going on during the Stalin era. Right. So Stalin, who was the leader of the Soviet Union from the late 19, early to mid 1920s up until his death in 1953, was known as sort of being this brutal dictator. And some of that is without question true. Right. Like, like so... The, the question of the purges and the show trials and the, the sort of political executions, all that's true. Yeah. Like that's not, and, and Perini <laughs> even makes a point of saying that, that all of that is obviously true. What is not true is the extent to which, the extent to which people died in the Soviet Union. So like right. Western historians often talk about like, you know, 10 million, 20 million, 100, 100 million, people, million million people <laughs> died. And that's not true. Right. So like, how do they get that number? How do they get those numbers, right? Well, they pull them, most of them just pull them right out of their ass. Yeah. So right. the reason why the chapter is called Stalin's Fingers is because he recalls a story that a British historian takes at face value as being a, an admission by Stalin of the death of 10 million people. And okay. so there is an historian who, let's see. So... Apparently, there's a story about how Winston Churchill asked Stalin um, uh, how many people died during the famines of the 1930s. Okay. Now, one thing that's really important to note about the famines that happened in the Soviet Union, they were right. They were real, right? Yeah. But why uh, – people will bring up the Holodomor, Holod, Holodomor incident as one particular thing in which you know a lot of people died due to famine. Well, why did that happen? It happened because the Kulaks, who were the sort of like proto petty bourgeois um, farmer class, decided that they weren't going to um, jive with Stalin's government and, in fact, okay. destroyed some of their own crops themselves in an effort to stop Stalin's government from um, taking over the grain for the benefit of the people. Right. Right. Now, that's one particular read of it that comes from people like Michael Prenny. Um, another one is a sort of, you know, revisionist historian named Grover Furr. You know, again, take this stuff, you know, with a little bit of skepticism. I think it's important to read stuff on your own and get a sense of your own critical judgment. But this is some of the stuff about it, right? The other thing that's important to note about famines, which I think is super important to note, is that when famines happen in capitalist parts of the world, they're never counted as deaths by capitalism. No. So, for example, the potato famine in Ireland, a lot of people, the common notion of the potato famine in Ireland was that they had widespread crop failures. And because of that, 
a lot of people died of famine or they left, right? That's not actually what happened. There was there were crop issues, but like the the the, the potato crop was largely good. The problem was was the actual capitalist government of 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 England at the time, because remember at the time Ireland was a part of the United Kingdom. It didn't become yeah. an independent country till you know dec- you know hundred over hundred years later. Um, uh, basically led to widespread shortages. It was, it was a problem of distribution, not production. But those are never counted in the deaths of capitalism, right? You know, the, the hundreds of thousands of dead and regime change wars are never called deaths of capitalism. Yeah. You know, the, 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 the 46,000 people in the United States that die every year because of lack of health insurance, that's never counted as, as, as a casualty of capitalism, right? Yeah. And again, I'm saying this not to excuse the abuses of the Stalin period or the abuses of any governmental system. What I'm saying is that there's this weird, like, fucking double speak when it comes to the way that like the kill count of like a government is right and this gets to the most important point which is that the total prison population of russia at the height of the purges this is late 1930s was two million twenty two thousand nine seventy six right not tens of millions not hundreds of millions Two million. Now, is that a high number? Yes. yes. Is that probably bad? Yes. <laughs> Having said that, that's kind of around the prison population in the United States today. Right now. Yeah. Right now. <laughs> right. And that's actually a point he makes in the footnote, which is that if you include the 1.6 million in prison, this was in 1995. So it's well over 2 million now and include the 5.3 million who are under correctional supervision, either per, uh, per, parole, 3 million on probation. Um, you know, you Sorry, 3 million in probation, 700,000 people on parole. You have a total of 5.3 million people within the criminal justice system in the United States, far surpassing anything the Soviet Union ever had. One of the things that's also important is that they they always said, like, what about the gulags? Well, like, the gulags were bad, but, like, at the same time, they were never as bad as people thought them to be. Not to mention the fact that most of them were largely cleared out by the end of the Soviet Union era anyway. Most of, I mean, half of the gulags, half the population of these prisons was released during the Khrushchev years, during the eras of reform, right? Right, So, like, you have that. And so, the other important statistic that's important, that comes not from something out of his butt, but actually comes from actual Soviet archives that were opened after the end of the government and were discovered in 1993, the actual number of executions in the Soviet Union from 1921 to 1953 was 799,455. Again, not a great number. Very high number. (laughs) Very high number. Not great. Okay. Not great by any stretch of the imagination, okay? But it's not the fucking millions that they say it is, right? No, the way it was framed to me when I was growing up was uh, Stalin personally killed 10 million people. (laughs) With his fucking bare hands. (laughs) Because, and I'm not going to, I am not a Stalin fan. (laughs) <laughs> and, and, I'm, and I'm not either. And neither is Perini. Like he's saying these statistics and these points right. to underscore the fact that there's a very large propaganda campaign that exists. Yeah. And if you look at these numbers, whether it's the prison population, the number of executions, it's not unheard of compared to the United States. If anything, it's less. Right. Yeah. Because it doesn't take into account the fact that we, we basically committed a genocide against the Native Americans when we took this country over. Yeah. And it doesn't account the, the, the thousands, if not millions of dead due to the slave trade. You know, so like the United States, like this idea that the United States is like this perful, perfect moral beacon and the Soviets were like these evil, right. awful people is bullshit. They both have their problems. And it's important to be honest about that, which yeah. is like, which is, which is Perenni's larger point. Um, we're getting close on time, so I'll go through uh, a couple other important things. So the next two chapters in the book are all about the sort of the fall of the Soviet Union and the emergence of um, the capitalist states in Russia and in Eastern Europe, the breakup of Yugoslavia and um, and the sort of shift to the right. And the thing that's important is people often think that like the the, the Soviet people sort of embraced capitalism with open arms. That's not necessarily true. They embraced some of it with open arms. Right. You know, they liked the blue jeans. They liked the rock and roll. What they didn't like was their was their was their welfare state being taken away from them, which is what exactly what happened. Yeah. Um, life expectancy dropped dramatically in the 1990s after the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, malnutrition 
um, widespread poverty exploded um, and led to massive issues. The other thing that's really important is that, you know, we spent years before COVID um, talking about Russiagate. You know, Rachel Maddow, every other yes. minute of her show, she was talking about, oh, the Russians were interfering on in elections. One thing that's very important is that in 1996, when Boris Yeltsin, the first president of the Russian Federation after the fall of the Soviet Union, was running for re-election, and the United States explicitly gave money and expertise to his campaign in order to make sure that he won. The United States act as an outside interference in, a, in an election in Russia. Mm -hmm. So when people want to come, there's an enormous difference between Russians and a fucking troll farm somewhere buying a bunch of Facebook ads and running Facebook groups called woke blacks, which was one that they, they called it. <laughs> right. Cause you know, they have a, you know, as Adam Johnson says on the, the citations needed podcast episode on, on um, Russia gate, they talked about how, you know, they wanted to sound social justice, but they had a very tenuous grasp of the English language. So, uh, right. so there's an enormous difference between buying a bunch of fucking Facebook ads and running like a, you know, you know, woke blacks Facebook page versus spending literally millions of dollars and both direct cash and IMF guarantees and the explicit support of the Clinton government in the United States to make sure that you won. Not to mention the fact that Boris Yeltsin, when he took over, essentially um, shut down the Duma, which was the the legislature of Russia, and he ruled as a virtual dictator for over a year <laughs> in the Russian Federation, something the United States had no problem with because he was issuing in neoliberalism in the country. So the United States has no problems with dictators in Russia so long as they're doing their capitalist bidding. Um, so that's those couple chapters. He has a chapter on Marxism, and then he has a chapter on class. And with that, we'll skip over to two quotes specifically. Um, before we get to those quotes, is there anything specifically you want to comment on? I, I know we're, get, we're getting up close to time. so No, I don't have anything to add. <laughs> okay. Okay, so the chapter on Marxism is really important. He makes the – he stresses the point that – um, Marxism is not a, a sort of positivist science in the sense that it's like chemistry or physics. But what Marxism is, is a social science. It's a way of us, it's a way for us to understand the world. It's a way for us to put together a bunch of disparate elements and pieces of data and start to make general conclusions about the world. Yeah. And Marxism is very, very important. And in fact, is probably more important than ever because of the nature of capitalism. And he wrote that in 1997. It's 25 years, almost 25 years later. Right. And it's gotten even worse. Right. Yeah. So I'm going to leave. I'm going to say, quote him here. He says, most Marxists are neither chiliastic nor utopian. Chiliastic means like wanting to bring on the end of the world. Mm -hmm. um, apocalyptic. They dream not of a perfect society, but of a better, more just life. They make no claim to eliminating all suffering and recognize that even in the best of times, there are the inevitable assaults of misfortune, mortality, and other vulnerabilities of life. And certainly in any society, there are some people who, for whatever reason, are given to wrongful deeds and self-serving corruptions. The highly imperfect nature of human beings should make us all the more determined not to see power and wealth accumulating in the hands of an unaccountable few which is the central dedication of capitalism. Uh, and I think that's a really great overview of what Marxism is. You know, we don't, we, we don't pretend to be utopian. Right. We seek to build a better world now with the conditions we have now and then build towards something even better in the future. And then the last chapter is about the importance of class analysis, which was largely starting to become largely absent by the mid 90s with a sort of academic turn of the political left and abandoning Marxism. Yeah. But he has this quote, which is really important for the discussions around class reductionism we often hear today, which is he says, to embrace a class analysis is not to deny the significance of identity issues, but to see how those, how these are linked both to each other and to the overall structure of politico-economic power. An awareness of class relations deepens our understanding of culture, race, gender, and other such things. And he also says that that's extremely important for the environment as well. So, you know, as you said earlier, right, it's intersectional, right? It's all these different, yeah. these different variables, right? Class is one of them. And it's a very important one, right? Yep. And in the United States, in my opinion, the two most important variables are class and race. Um, you know, gender is very, very important too. But like, if you're understanding the history of American structure, class and race are very intertwined, right? Yeah. And the whole structure really, is based on these two things. <laughs> yes. 
And so, you know, and then of course you can break down by like gender lines and, and, and so forth. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So we're right in an hour. So, um, uh, I know how much hard work you put into editing this stuff. So I want to keep it as short as I can. So anyway, black shirts and reds, it's an incredibly important book. It's a book that everybody I think should read regardless of your sort of political tendency on the left. And, um, and I think it will equip you with some really good information about the lies and the distortions and the misrepresentations of communism and really existing socialism in our media and in political circles, in the academics, in academic life, um, newspapers, so on and so forth. And it's also important to understanding how fascism really works because fascism really is capitalism in decay. That's what it is. And, and it's when imperialism sure. comes home. So yeah, so my, so yeah, highly recommend the book. It's incredible. Uh, and, um, we will probably do another Michael Prenny book in the future. Um, and because he's somebody who has had a really deep impact on me and in terms of my own political orientation. So, sure. so that's it. <laughs> so what are we, do we know what we're covering next time? Yes, we do. So next time we will be covering, I'm pretty sure next week or next time, we will be covering a book called, let me see if I can get it on the screen here. <laughs> it's called The Origin of Capitalism, A wow. Longer View cool. by Ellen Meekson's Wood. This book is a really great corollary to Black Shirts and Reds in that it talks about the origins of capitalism and how there's the very traditional notion of what how capitalism came about that is even informed in some of Marx's work but that we actually have to think about it a little differently. And so I think it's a cool book and I look forward to talking about it with you um, next time. Right on. And where can people find your content? Sure. So people can find me at justinclark.org. That's my website. Um, and then um, I also have my Instagram page, justinclarkph, where I post book reviews and all other stuff. Um, the other thing is that... Um, I will be having an article be coming out probably sometime in September, October about the friendship of, of uh, Robert Ingersoll, the late 19th century free thought order and Eugene Victor Debs, the socialist leader in America. I'm, I started actually started writing that today. And so that'll be coming out. That'll be available um, in the truth seeker magazine, or it will be available for free at the Indiana historical bureaus blog where I work. Very cool. Well, thank you again for another great review and uh, see you next time, I guess. Thank you. Thank you.